We all know the age-old story. A genius inventor awakes from slumber with a eureka moment. Well, not so, says author Kevin Ashton. Joining us now to tell us why this creativity myth is in need of debunking, the aforementioned Kevin Ashton, author of How to Fly a Horse, The Secret History of Creation, Invention, and Discovery. And it's great to have you up here at TVO. Thank you. Very me. nice to meet you. Your bio calls you a technology pioneer, but that's not a title that you have always always had. <laughs> what did you go to school for? Scandinavian studies. I studied Ibsen in the original Norwegian. Because you wanted to read Hedda Gabler in the original. I went to uh, Norway as a young man and fell in love with uh, Henrik Ibsen and decided that's what I was going to study when I went to school. How long did that last? Ibsen? No, I mean your that 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 oh. being your career path because that's not. Oh, where that you was ended that up. was that was not certainly not a career path. The um, it was clear to me fairly early that the market for professional Ibsen scholars was uh, <laughs> was small and, and, and quite well served. So uh, It didn't need you. Yeah, I was uh, always going to go do something else after I got a, a good liberal arts degree. Well, that something else was, I mean, talk a lot about it in the book, and then you came up, I guess, 20 years ago with the Internet of Things. Yes. What did that mean? You coined that. Yes. What did that mean? Uh, so I was a young executive at a company called Procter & Gamble, which makes soap Everything. powder and toilet paper and various things and we were having trouble keeping our products on the shelf and this was frustrating to me so I wanted to understand what was causing this problem it wasn't that we hadn't made enough products they just weren't getting to the shelf and there was an information problem the stores kind of knew what they had in the warehouse but they didn't know at the individual product level what was on the shelf and the solution to that we decided, or I decided, was to put little microchips in the products and have them send radio signals so we could track them. And now I had to explain this to a bunch of very old, white Procter & Gamble executives who barely knew how to use a computer in the 1990s. Uh, but they did, did know the internet was something they were supposed to be excited about. So uh, I took the word internet and the word things and quite ungrammatically put the word of in the middle, and uh, that was the title of my PowerPoint presentation to convince the CEO of Procter & Gamble that they should put microchips in their product so they wouldn't be out of stock. It was the lipstick. That's it what was the lipstick. Was I was working on color cosmetics. I went from Henry Gibson mm -hmm. to color cosmetics, uh, came up with this thing, the Internet of Things, and got uh, a little bit of money to try and make it real. And that led me to MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts. and. Uh, we had a very good few years uh, making the Internet of Things a real thing rather than a, a PowerPoint presentation, and, uh, and here I am. And this radio frequency identification yes. solved the problem? Yes, absolutely. Let me read an excerpt from your book here, and we're going to get into this creativity myth. Here we go. This, there is a myth about how something new comes to be. Geniuses have dramatic moments of insight where great things and thoughts are born whole. Poems are written in dreams. Symphonies are composed complete. Science is accomplished with eureka shrieks. Businesses are built by magic touch. Something is not, then is. We do not see the road from nothing to new, and maybe we do not want to. Lots to unpack here. Where does this myth come from? So the, the myth of creativity really emerged in the late 1800s. Uh, it has three components, and we sort of mentioned some of them there, but the, the, the genius, so a, a uniquely gifted, normally white guy, uh, who doesn't think like you or I, has some special faculty for thinking which is not available to us. Uh, he solves problems by not thinking about them, uh, and the solution eventually comes to him after some period of not thinking about them in some moment of clarity which is the aha moment or the eureka moment. Now, that, that became popular in the early 1900s. That's when the word creativity was coined, in 1926. Um, and, and you see it become increasingly popular through the 20th century as the sort of umbrella term for these ideas, uh, none of which are true. Why do you reject them? Um, they've been studied extensively, first of all, and have been found to be not true. Um, secondly, when you look at the true stories of people creating, which is something I did for the book, uh, you find every single time this is not a genius having ideas that appear out of nowhere. This is somebody using ordinary, familiar thinking to solve a problem, taking things one step at a time, failing, taking wrong turns, and eventually 
and gradually, by building on their own work and the work of other people, coming to an extraordinary solution. We'll follow up on examples in a second, but the last line of that quote I want to follow up on here too. Maybe we do not want to, you say. Why would we prefer to believe the myth rather than the truth? Oh, I think there are probably three reasons. Um, first of all, it's very convenient to think that there's a drive-through window for extraordinary creation, and maybe one day we will find it, and someone will hand us something wonderful and magical, and we won't really have had to do any work. It will just fall into our lap. So that appeals to our laziness. Um, a lot of people want to believe they are more special than everybody else. So the myth of the genius is very appealing if you believe you might be a genius. That's something you will argue for, because in arguing for the existence of geniuses, you can implicitly argue for your own genius. So that appeals to our ego. And then there's a third thing, which I think it's easy to confuse magic with wonder. The idea that if something is mysterious, it is wonderful. And if it is explainable, then somehow it's, it loses its shine. It's not as exciting. That's just not true. The, the way the human race creates things is wonderful, even though we understand it, even though it's familiar, and even though it's ordinary to us, because it's innate in everybody. Do you reject the notion that genius doesn't exist at all? There are no examples of people who have that eureka moment. I appreciate that you're saying the majority is the way you've described it. But Surely yeah, there are people in whose DNA there is brilliance and they're just different from the rest there of us. There are people in whose DNA uh, there is brilliance and that's all of us. Now that's not the same thing as saying everybody can do anything or everybody's equally talented. The original meaning of genius is a Roman word and for several thousand years it meant something like spirit or soul and everybody had it. It's your unique essence or my unique essence, the thing that makes us different from all the billions of people that have existed before us, all the billions of people that will exist after us. That's our unique spark, if you like. But everybody has that. It was only in the 1800s with the idea of eugenics, that you can selectively breed people, that led to the genocide of the Holocaust, that the word genius took on a new meaning, this hereditary general ability that only a few people had. That is not true. And now apparently you can use it when referring to football coaches even. I mean, the word has lost, <laughs> the word has lost, well, you being in Boston, Bill, uh, Bel Bill Belichick is a genius, as you know. Uh, well, the, the yeah. interesting thing about that is every time you find an example of a genius, and football coaches know this very well, <laughs> they're idiots until they succeed, <laughs> right. and then retrospectively, they're recast as geniuses. Also true of somebody like Einstein. Hmm. Um, so if, if you're only a genius after you've succeeded, then there's nothing predictive about genius whatsoever. Let's do some examples here. The Dyson vacuum cleaner. Yes. You want to take us through how that thing, that, let's go brief here, because I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover, okay. but essentially take us, from, sure. take us from when it wasn't to when okay. it was. So James Dyson, a British guy, uh, was frustrated with his own vacuum cleaner. Uh, it's really that simple. Uh, it clogged up when, when the bag got full. One day he was uh, thinking about this problem and he noticed that sawmills use cyclones to extract dust and he wondered if there was a way to, uh, to make that tiny and put it in a vacuum cleaner. And there was, and it took him over 5,000 prototypes to make one that worked. And the, the story of the, the Dyson vacuum cleaner is he didn't give up the first time or the thousandth time, he just kept going until he figured it out. Five years. Five, Five? years, 5,000 prototypes, Lots of failures. I'm never going to look at a can of Coke the same <laughs> way again because you've taken us through a story on how it starts from nothing mm -hmm. and gets to something that is really quite astonishing. And obviously none of us had ever thought about it before. Uh, but take us through it. It starts in the ground of Australia, I guess. Yes. Yeah. So uh, I mean, there's two parts, right? There's the can and then there's the the coke inside it. But uh, yeah, the can of Coca-Cola starts with a raw material called bauxite, which is most commonly strip mined in Western Australia by these huge self-driving trucks that are, are remotely controlled from hundreds of miles away. Um, and you know, gradually that's by a long chain of processes is turned into uh, aluminum, which is then turned into a can. And then the ingredients in the can come from all over the world. The principal ingredients in Coca-Cola are vanilla, 
which is the oh, drop. Oh, we're not even there yet. No, we sorry, 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 Kevin, you okay. forgot about the coating you've got to put on the inside oh, of the yeah. can well, there's, there's, so it doesn't leach we into have the... To, yeah, we have to coat the inside exactly. so that the, the metal doesn't get in. Mm. We have to coat the outside so it looks nice. We mm. have to put a lid on which is thicker than the aluminum in the outside of the can because the bubbles will otherwise cause it to pop off. Mm -hmm. um, oh, on and on it goes, yeah. And then we get to vanilla and cinnamon and cocaine and all the other things that, that and go fizz. into the soda. And the fizz, absolutely. And then you got to bottle it. Yep. If you want to bottle it. Uh, yep. You've got to take it's, it somewhere. And then you've got to put it on a truck and uh, put it in a store and someone's got to take it home and refrigerate it. It's a very complicated process that takes over a year. And um, how many different continents? All of them apart from Antarctica. Coca-Cola is you know, presented as this incredibly American product, but uh, it's a product of the whole world. And then it comes to you and you can buy it for a buck. Absolutely, on any street that. corner anywhere in the world. I frequently do. <laughs> it's actually an incredible story. Let's talk gender for a second here. And uh, Sheldon, if you would, I'm on page three here. Let's bring up this graph for starters if we can. If you look at the people who have won the Nobel Prize for science, yep. The, this is like uh, Republicans and Democrats here. But we've got <laughs> blue states and red states. We've got males overwhelmingly compared to females in yeah. medicine, in physics, in chemistry. And I think the way you put it is if your last name's not Curie, yeah. uh, the number of women who have won some of these prizes is precisely one. Well, one of those physics prizes is Marie Curie. One right. of the chemistry prizes is Marie Curie. Right. And one of the chemistry prizes is her daughter, Irene Curie. So, um, yes. Uh, very few women win Nobel Prizes in science. You tell us in the book this obviously doesn't mean that men are better at science than women. It tells something else. What's yeah, the something uh, else? A lot of those men won prizes for work done by women. The story I tell in the book is of Rosalind Franklin who discovered the structure of DNA, had her work stolen by three men who went on to win the Nobel Prize. Uh, and they are you know, famous now, Watson and Crick particularly, as discovering the structure of DNA, and frankly, they did no such thing. They stole a photograph that Rosalind Franklin had taken using a special camera that she had developed, which revealed the structure of DNA. She died a few years later not knowing they'd stolen her work. But th there are many other examples of women who had their work borrowed, appropriated, developed, or, or otherwise taken by men who then win the Nobel Prize. So the, the real scandal is it's not that we need more women in science. It's we need to recognize the women who are already there. Why don't we? We live in a white male dominated world. And there's an assumption that if there's a white man in the room and a good idea comes out, that it must be the white guy. Um, and the white guy gets promoted. And then the white guy gets the credit. And the white guy wins the prize. It really is that simple. This is not a story about the prejudices of the Nobel Prize Committee. They really are just reflecting the prejudices of the society in which they operate. Now that we know that the fix is in against yeah. women and we live in a fairer, kinder, gentler world, can we assume that this will no longer be the case going forward? Uh, I, I reject the premise of the, the <laughs> kinder, fairer, gentler I, world. I, 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 I was being somewhat facetious, of course. Sorry. Yeah. Things are improving slightly, but the Nobel Prize is an interesting one. What one would hope is that women are more likely to win the Nobel Prize now than they were in Marie Curie's day, and that's barely true. Women win a Nobel Prize in science about once every seven years and have done for 100 years or so. Ever twice in a row? Uh, once, I think. Once, twice in a row. Yes, very seldom. Hmm. And often it's a joint award with, with the man. Uh, as Marie Curie's first one was. Her husband was dead, so he couldn't get the second one. She did the work. She made it clear she did the work. But the assumption was her husband must have, must have done most of it, so he got the prize too. Does anybody intend to do anything about this? I do. What do you want to do about it? Uh, I'm going to talk about it to anybody who will listen. I think the, the most interesting thing about human creation is it is how we survive as a species. We depend on our ability to create new technology to survive. By creating new technology, we create new problems. You know, our current biggest problem is climate change, for example. Once we solve that, and I'm sure we will, there'll be another problem that we have to solve again. We need all hands on deck. If we are a species that depends on creating to survive, we must not limit who can create. So that the days of, you know, you really need to be a white guy ideally a dead white guy, it turns out, to, to, to have the privilege of creating, those days have to be over. We really need everybody 
to be able to bring their, their unique essence, their true genius, to, to, to the table and, and contribute the thing that they are here to do. You do, near the end of the book, try to tell us you're not much of a Malthusian, are you? You just no. not, you're not buying that. <laughs> Let's start with this. I want to unpack some of this here. Yes. Let's start with who was Malthus? What did he believe? And then we'll, okay. we'll and then we'll go into why you're not on side with him. Thomas Malthus was a, uh, I guess, a vicar in the uh, 19th century, and uh, he recognized something, which was that the human population was growing rapidly. He actually uh, underestimated how how rapidly it was growing. Uh, there's many billions more of us than there was in his day. The, what he did famously was conclude that we were going to run out of food because there were too many of us. There was no way to sustain the population that, that was coming. And, and we'd there, all starve. Therefore, there would be war and famine. Now, what actually happened was the opposite. Not only did the population increase more than he anticipated, but famine and war decreased. The reason is the more people you have, the more creating you have, the more problems get solved. So as our population grows, so does our creative capacity, which is why we now live in this age where famine has practically been eradicated. There are a couple of places in Africa that still suffer from famine, which is not the same as hunger. Mm -hmm. Hunger is when you don't have enough food. Famine is when there is not enough food. Um, and we are less warlike than we've ever been in human history. So things are improving for us because there are more of us which is the opposite of what he imagined would happen. It's the opposite of what he imagined. It is a point you put forward, and my hunch is most people don't believe it. My hunch is people think there's more famine, there's more war, Absolutely. this is a more dangerous world, et cetera, et cetera. So why do we think that if it's so obviously not true? Well, I think um, a lot of people are inclined to be a little negative, first <laughs> of all. Um, and uh, you know, war and so on makes good drama. Makes good drama if you're, for example, on, on news. And it's important that we know what's going on in the world so, so we can, you know, how much war is enough war? Well, we want no war. So it's, it's good that we're focused on the problems, but we have to put them in context and in perspective. And the data is overwhelming. This is not a matter of opinion. You are far less likely to die a violent death now than at any time in human history. Stephen Pinker wrote that book, right? Absolutely, well, and it's a fantastic book. Yeah. We, we live in the safest. The better angels of our nation. Better angels. Of, there we go. Good Canadian boy. Here's another excerpt from your book, uh, which actually reflects on what you were just saying. When population grows, our ability to create grows even faster. There are more people creating, so there are more people with whom to connect. There are more people creating, so there are more tools in the tool chain. There are more people creating, so we have more time, space, health, education, and information for creating. Population is production. The population of the Earth is what now? Are we 7 billion now today? Close to, yeah. Almost 7 billion. And of course, rising significantly. 10 billion by the end of the century. Wow. Maybe 11. Why are you convinced that our ability to be creative and solve the problems that will come with that much more population uh, won't be dwarfed by the potential negative consequences of having that many people on the planet? because that's what's always happened in the past. That what doesn't mean it'll always happen in the future, does it? It means it's most likely to. And it's not simply a question of, oh, well, this has always happened in the past, it'll happen in the future. There's a clear mechanism at work, which is we are innately creative beings. We solve the problems that we see. Uh, and we build on the work of others. So there are more others upon who we can build upon whose work we can build. And we have better communication so we understand what everybody else is doing. Plus, we have more time to create because basic problems like having enough to eat and drink have been taken care of by, by the way, by technology. Yeah. We have education. We have longer life expectancy. So when you look at all the mechanisms in play and what has caused us to be so successful as a species over the last 50,000 years, it's fairly clear that we're going to continue in the same way. You're not pessimistic enough about the future, I'm afraid. No, I'm an optimist. I know it's very <laughs> unfashionable, but I, I'm trying to bring optimism back. Uh, pessimism just doesn't stand up to fact. It really doesn't. It's an intellectually cheap way to sound clever. And anybody who's pessimistic, they need to provide me with some verifiable facts uh, to explain why things are going to be so bad, because all the evidence is against them. 
there's a line in that quote I just said, there are more people with whom to connect. Yes. Are you sure that the world, that we individually want to be even more connected with everybody else than we already are? Absolutely. It's a fundamental drive. This is why everyone's always staring at their phones in every street corner right now. And it's uh, why there's a reaction to it now, too, there, that, that people are realizing we've got to get away from these devices. I don't see anybody really doing that. And I think the... Uh, the, the, the good things so often outweigh the bad. Yeah, we should probably go to sleep a little earlier rather than playing Angry Birds till 1 a.m. or something. <laughs> but the ability to communicate with one another, to read things that other people are working on, to find any academic paper instantly if you're studying something or researching something, all these things are amazingly, amazingly powerful. We should finish off on the one question that I suspect everybody has wanted me to ask since we started talking <laughs> 20 plus minutes ago. And that is the title of your book, which was inspired, yes. I gather, by the Wright brothers. So Absolutely. So why don't you explain how to fly a horse? So Wilbur Wright was explaining how it was that the Wright brothers were the first people to fly, which is an interesting question because they weren't the first people to think of flying and they weren't the first people to try to fly. Uh, and he explained that the problem they set out to solve was different. The problem they set out to solve was not how to get in the air. It was how to balance your aircraft in the air. They were well positioned to understand the importance of balance because they were bicycle engineers. Now we think of bicycles as a technology that's always been around. Well, bicycles became popular in the late 1800s. That's when they were invented. And the fundamental problem is balance. Turns out it's the same thing for an airplane. You can jump off a bridge with wings strapped to your back and you'll be flying until you hit the ground and die. And people really <laughs> did do that. Yes. Um, so the question is, how do you stay in the air? And you have to be able to balance in face of all these gusts of winds and turbulence and all the other things that come to you. And so what uh, Orville Wright did, he took a piece of paper, dropped it to the ground, and said to his audience, see how it darts hither and thither. This is the kind of horse we must learn how to ride if we want to fly. He didn't say horse. He said steed. He said steed. You caught me. Yes. But that's not quite as sexy a title as <laughs> How it? to fly a steed just probably wasn't going to work. Correct. Uh, what an interesting read. What a fun read as well. And uh, thanks for the little boost of optimism there, which is never a bad thing. How to Fly a Horse, The Secret History of Creation, Invention, and Discovery. Kevin Ashton from Austin, Texas. Don't let the accent fool you. <laughs> thanks for coming into TVO. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.